I'm Chris Martin, and this is Half Hour of Heterodoxy. This show is produced by Heterodox Academy. You can find out more about us at heterodoxacademy.org. You can also find us on Facebook under Heterodox Academy and on Twitter at HDX Academy. My guest today is Deb Mashek. She's the new executive director of Heterodox Academy, and this is her first appearance on our podcast. Deb also goes by Deborah. I mentioned that if you want to search for her scholarly publications. She's currently a tenured professor of psychology at Harvey Mudd College, and despite being very happy with her job there, she's decided to leave and join us here at Heterodox Academy. You can follow her on Twitter at Deb Mashek HXA. That's D E B M A S H E K H X A. So here is Deb Mashek. Welcome to the show and welcome to Heterodox Academy. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for joining us for this episode and congratulations on your appointment. So you're currently a professor of psychology at Harvey Mudd, but you started out studying psychology, biology, and women's studies. So tell me a bit about how you got from there to where you are right now. Yeah, so I was uh, an undergrad at Nebraska Wesleyan University where, as you mentioned, I was studying biopsychology and women's studies. And then from there, I moved on to Stony Brook University, where I received my MA and my PhD in social psychology uh, with an emphasis in quantitative methods. And my expertise uh, developed there in close relationships. And I studied um, the the self-expansion model. And the idea there is that through relationships, we take on the resources, the identities, and the perspectives of other people, and then ultimately increase our own agency in the world through through interpersonal connection. Um, Since then, I've applied that theoretical frame uh, to the study of romantic relationships and incarcerated people, college students, and also interinstitutional collaboration. So after Stony Brook, I went on for a three-year research fellowship at George Mason. And then, as you mentioned, in 2005, made the move to Harvey Mudd College, which is a small liberal arts school in Claremont, California. We're very STEM-focused, and we're one of the the Claremont colleges, which includes uh, Pomona, Scripps, Pitzer, Claremont McKenna, Harvey Mudd, Claremont Graduate University and Keck Graduate Institute. So last year you applied to our director position at Heterodox Academy. What made you decide to do that? It's a great question. So I, you know, I'm at this job. I absolutely love working with students and colleagues who just wow me every single day. Um, And, and I'm getting ready to leave it. And so the question is why in the world would I do such a thing? Uh, And the answer has to do with, I'm, I'm worried about what I'm seeing in the broader landscape of higher ed. Um, you know, given my my relationships work, I, I think a lot about relationships among people, among institutions, among ideas. And I'm I'm personally very fascinated by the kind of these emergent properties of togetherness, the ways that when we come together, we can think, we can create, we can discover uh, when there's really room at the table for diverse people, diverse ideas. And uh, and I'm worried that that higher ed has become increasingly ideologically homogenous, that we're developing these these monocultures. And I worry that there's not space at the table for everybody to be playing together and with the playing around with the the most difficult questions and problems that our our world faces. And I, I worry that if we don't make room, if we don't make that space, if we don't take seriously the idea of uh, heterodoxy, that uh, we're, we're going to be pursuing and advancing solutions that ultimately won't be as durable as they could have been had we had uh, more more space at the table for everybody. And do you see this as both an issue in teaching? I know you've done a lot of teaching, both in teaching and in research. I do. And that's one of the things that really strikes me about the, the Heterodox Academy mission that I'm drawn to is this the focus on these twin goals of the academy. So we need to be able to create um, the best research out there. And to do that, we need to make sure you know, that there aren't already, or we, we know that there are a lot of assumptions in, in terms of the questions we ask, the methods we use, how we um, analyze and interpret the data and what, what data um, we deploy and how we deploy it on behalf of policy and whatnot. So that, that research wing is super important, absolutely critical to solving those world's biggest problems. And on the other side, we also, on the teaching side, we need to be able to offer students the opportunity to have exposure to a range of ideas. So these are the students, obviously, who are going to graduate, go out and be the policymakers, be the citizens who are active in their communities and and who are continue to engage ideas. And so we want 
them, in fact, we want all of us to really have fluency with a range of ideas and not just, uh, you know, sometimes I worry that in the classroom, we might be able to offer kind of a caricature of there are these other people who think this other thing, but it's not necessarily going into the, the level of depth or nuance that would actually enable our students to make use of those ideas out in the real world as they're trying to solve those big problems. Um, so I do, I, I also, you know, I absolutely think about this in terms of teaching. I want to focus on helping students think how they want to think as opposed to what to think and, um, and having ideologically diverse spaces in the classroom on the campus enables that sort of intellectual growth. In the classes you've taught, do you feel like you've had a mix of centrists, liberals, and conservatives so far? Yeah. So in my classrooms, um, we definitely have a, a broad range of students who are present. And it's also the case that while our classroom discussions are largely very open and we, we are able to bring in a lot of ideas, it's also the case that I regularly have students, colleagues um, swinging by for closed door conversations where they're you know, saying things like there was this question I wanted to ask in class or there was an idea I wanted to raise in a meeting, but I didn't feel comfortable doing so because I thought, um, you know, I might, the other students might um, tell me that that was, or that I'm being ridiculous or that um, that's a, an offensive question even. And that has a very chilling effect on, on inquiry and on um, the pursuit of knowledge. So that kind of self-censorship, I think, has been a, was a concern of John Heights as well. And it's a concern of a number of people who joined Heterodox Academy. In terms of how we solve that problem, how do you feel like going into the future, Heterodox Academy is going to going to tackle that issue? Well, yeah, I would love to talk about the the broad um, strategic vision for Heterodox Academy. But to that question in particular, I think we need to back up and really think about how do we equip our students, ourselves with, you know, what I, I find myself referring to as the habits of heart and mind to engage constructively across difference. And to me, the, the big, the, the four things that I would encourage people to focus on there is how do we cultivate intellectual curiosity? So rather than um, having those moments where, you know, someone says something that is at odds with what you believe, how do we get it to the point where instead of saying, you believe what? As though it's the worst thing anyone could have possibly imagined, but instead getting us to the point where we can say, you believe what? And tell me more about that. And how did you come to that? And how do you see it? Let's walk through um, your understanding of it. And really thinking about engagement as an opportunity for understanding the other person's point of view, as opposed to trying to um, explain to them why why surely they're they're wholly wrong. Um, so intellectual curiosity is one of the one of the markers there of those habits of heart and mind. Another one being intellectual humility. So um, I don't I don't know about you, but I find myself wrong quite often, <laughs> and in and just holding that possibility in mind when we engage with others who who see the world differently, that you know chances are that I am uh, this one person, this one place and time that probably my experiences uh, probably have not somehow um, enabled me to have the one the one right perspective on the world and just. To have that humility to say, I, I need to see, I, I need to see what others are seeing also, um, and then the other ones being empath- empathy and perspective taking. That you know, my belief is that humans are fundamentally good people, and um, if we take the time to figure out where they're coming from, um, their their ideas probably won't seem as uh, as just ridiculous as sometimes I think our knee jerk uh, assumption tends to be. I really like those three ideas, especially the first. Uh, I did some research for my own dissertation on anxiety and why college students appear to be more anxious than they used to be. And uh, someone I interviewed, incidentally, also from California, he's a psychiatrist there who's worked with a lot of college students, says that students aren't sure how to cope with this concept of political correctness. I think they generally want to be sensitive, but they don't really have any concrete guidance. And I think if you break it down into principles like curiosity, humility, and an empathy and perspective taking that actually gives students um, something concrete to work with. Yeah, I totally agree. And I was um, thinking, you know, so many of our institutions have orientation programs and whatnot for their incoming first year students. And one of the tools, um, I know you've talked about it before uh, on the podcast is that that open mind, um, the open mind tool. And I would, I would just be thrilled if we could help uh, 
you know, administrators and professors bring that tool into their orientations to help equip students with exactly those habits of heart and mind um, to, to start figuring out how to navigate the campus, the campus culture. <laughs> so tell me a bit more about your broader vision for Heterodox Academy. So, you know, I'll be a, a dork here and start back with what is the mission of Heterodox Academy. And our, our mission is to improve the quality of research and teaching in universities by increasing viewpoint diversity, mutual understanding, and constructive disagreement. So in terms of how, how we'll do that, um, you know, I think of the what is the HXA way? So what are the, the values that undergird our our efforts? And I think we absolutely love the academy. We have a deeply strong commitment to higher education. Um, we value constructive disagreement and, and, you know, again, those values of intellectual curiosity and humility and perspective taking and empathy, but also empiricism and, and engaging diverse viewpoints. We really want to walk the walk. Um, in terms of what, what's in store for 2018, I, you know, I've done a lot of um, work with our, we have a, a really stellar team uh at Heterodox Academy, and the, the teams come together to think through what are our, what are our priorities uh, for this coming year. And the first one is to create a vibrant network of engaged scholars and teachers. So, so much of what Heterodox Academy has done to date, and it's a it's a young organization, so it's really amazing to think about all of the work they've done. But it tends to be creating or writing a blog and sending it out. Um, calling research, you know, gathering some data and sending it out. And I'm really excited to say, you know what, we have these 1600 members. That's a lot of interest, a lot of talent and a lot of perspective. So what are our opportunities to create conduits for our members to connect with each other around shared concerns or shared opportunities, but also what are the opportunities for them to connect directly with, with our mission? So, you know, definitely we would like to continue building the membership there, um, engaging our members, you know, via social media, but also um, very soon we'll be sending out a, a member survey to ask the members, you know, in what ways would you like to get involved? What can we at Heterodox Academy do, be doing to better enable your efficacy in your local context for creating the change that you want to see? And we're also interested in creating working groups uh, around things. Uh, you know, so many of us are teachers, so I'm interested in helping us create a teaching committee where we can think about what are the best practices in the classroom setting for for creating the space where these uh, where diverse ideas can come together constructively. And we're also playing with the idea of creating some disciplinary based listservs. So you know, the psychologist if they want to if they want to play around with some ideas, they could do that and find each other more more easily than using the, the member search that's currently on the web page. We're looking for opportunities to build research collaborations around, around these questions of, you know, how do you best cultivate these habits of heart and mind? Or what are the, what are the consequences um, for, for learning and for discovery when you're working within the, the ideological monoculture versus when you have a heterodox space available? So all of those ideas fall under that, that first priority of creating the vibrant networks. And then our second priority is to create these, these really wonderful tools that are widely adopted or could be even more widely adopted on campus. And these include the Campus Expression Survey. So I think your um, listeners might already be familiar with this, but it's, it's a, a self-report instrument that professors or administrators can use either in a single classroom or ideally for, across an entire campus. And it offers an x-ray of the, of the campus. So um, seeking to answer the question or questions, who is afraid to speak up about which issues and why? So what do they imagine are the consequences if they don't? Um, so the campus expression survey, we got some nice uh, initial data from yourmorals.org. It, it's not a random sample by any stretch. And so one of the one of the things, because of our value toward, of uh, empiricism, one of the things we're going to be doing in the very near future is collecting some um, some population-based data on, on the validity of the campus expression survey. Um, another tool is the Guide to Colleges, which, uh, you know, our, we think of our target audience there as the, the high school students and their parents who are trying to figure out if I would like to send my, you know, if I would like to go study or send my um, child to a college or university where they're going to be challenged to think about a, a variety of ideas, how do I find such a place? And so the Guide to Colleges offers some, some rankings and some indicators so people can right away see, like, oh, I, I think that might be a good place for us to look for heterodoxy. 
And then there's that, the open mind platform, uh, which is, I've used it in two of my classes now and it's really wonderful. It's a, a free online uh, experience where students go through thinking about, well, why would I want, why would I benefit from being in a heterodox environment and having viewpoint diversity? Um, how does one cultivate intellectual humility and curiosity? And then it also offers these great little micro practices uh, within the app for that. There's an accompanying facilitation for workshops that can be paired with the online app, as well as a really lovely uh, research library or library that includes academic research, as well as writings from across the ages and across the lands, uh, essays and whatnot that professors can can make use of, or actually individuals as well, um, to cultivate these habits of heart and mind. Yeah, on the topic of uh, on the topic of the Open Mind platform, uh, I know that covers a certain variety of topics. Which ones have you tried, or have you tried all of them in the classroom so far? Yeah, I've assigned the full experience um, to students in my I'm Right, You're Wrong course, and then also in the Intellectual Virtues course. And for the intellectual virtues course, I'm also using the library as the the, the reading list for the class. So students, um, they get to pick each week which of the readings uh, in the library they would like to read in advance of class. And then we're using those as the platform or as the basis for our discussion about the ideas. So our, our third emphasis for this year is thinking about how to shape the, the broader social discourse about viewpoint diversity and how to engage that productively. So Obviously, you know, colleges and universities don't exist in a, in a bubble. We're absolutely one of the, the social foundations of, of the United States, at least. And um, we want to think through about how do we bring more voices into this conversation about the value of viewpoint diversity. And, you know, we're, we're writing op-eds. If we have members who are interested in writing op-eds and who would like feedback on them, we would absolutely be happy to help with that. We're looking for more people to contribute to the blog, to share what's happening on their campuses, their perspectives, and, um, and just making sure that we're, we're getting the word out beyond um, just our, our group of members. Because if, we, if we're just talking to ourselves, then, then we're missing an opportunity to, to shape discourse for society more broadly. So and in that regard, do we have some ongoing like, concrete efforts there or is that is that something we'll see later in 2018? I, I mean, there are some some concrete efforts. So, you know, the blog exists already. So if we if you have listeners who are interested in contributing to that, they can reach out to our communications director to participate there. One of the blog series that's new is uh, teaching heterodoxy. And there we're looking for examples from the classroom, whether it's demonstrations, actual syllabi, um, readings that have worked particularly well, and how did you engage them? I like the teaching heterodoxy. I think I sort of tried to do that a little when I started Half Hour of Heterodoxy as well, trying to do every fourth or fifth episode. I think episode four, if I recall, was with Christine Laguerre, and that was specifically about teaching techniques. So I think that's something that's going to be of a lot of value, especially to younger professors who are unprepared for these challenges and need to tackle them as soon as they get out the door. I absolutely agree. And it's also the case that, you know, so much of what happens in the classroom stays in the classroom, which I think is unfortunate because, you know, people are, people are finding really interesting ways of engaging these topics. And we should, we should make that both the process and the products of those efforts visible and available to, to other professors, because it's not, it's not obvious. These are difficult topics and to create uh, communities of inquiry around, around how to enable our students um, to think how to think as opposed to what to think. I, I think we're doing a, a service not just to our students and not just to the young professors, but ult ultimately to all of the all the people who are going out into the world and continue to engage with each other after college. That's right. I think that's part of what college is supposed to be for, but sometimes colleges can be very focused on one or two disciplines that students are majoring in, and they miss out on that a little. So do you have any closing thoughts before we wrap up? One of the, the things I'm really excited about is inviting administrators and professors into the conversation so that they can tell us how can we be a good partner. So, you know, every every campus is dealing with their own uh, local context, their own set of situations. And we don't want to imagine that we know everything that's happening on your campus. Instead, we were interested in what do you need? How can we best support you and your efforts? And along those lines, I'm really excited to hear from, you know, to hear from our members and to hear from our non-members um, what, what's happening on the ground. What are they seeing? Are they, see, you know, when are they seeing changes? Are, there, are they seeing opportunities of, 
ways that we could better influence uh, this value of viewpoint diversity on college campuses. So this is the the first of many conversations, I hope, and that people know that we want to hear from them and we want to be good partners. Well, I definitely hope this is the first of many conversations. And it's been good having you on the show. Thanks for joining us. It's been a pleasure, Chris. And thank you for all of your work on behalf of Heterodox Academy. I love your your podcast and your writing. And I know you're doing so many behind the scenes things. So it's it's noticed and appreciated. Thank you. All right. We'll talk to you soon.